Hi, my name's Scott the Miniature Maniac, and today we're gonna to take a beginner look at the airbrush. What up, Mini Family? Airbrushes are a double-edged sword. On one hand, they can expedite your miniature painting process quite a bit, and on the other hand, it's a new tool to learn and mess up with. Not sure about you guys, but my learning journey with an airbrush was not as advertised. I struggled quite a bit. So where do we even begin? Well, I think we should talk about the typical anatomy of an airbrush that you find in the miniature painting hobby. The most recognizable part of the airbrush is the needle. An airbrush needle comes in a variety of diameters. The general thought process is that the smaller the diameter of the needle, the more fine the control but I've personally found there to be diminishing returns the smaller you get with your needle diameter. Somewhere in the 0.3 millimeter diameter is the perfect size for your needle. Anything smaller than that seems to be a little bit too fragile, which is a real problem when handling tiny little needles like this. After the needle, probably the most obvious next part is the cup, which is not something found on all airbrushes. The typical style of airbrush you will see in the miniature painting hobby is a gravity-fed airbrush which places the cup above the main body. This allows gravity to do the work of feeding the paint to the front of the airbrush where it will be distributed from there. The alternative to this design isn't seen as often is called the siphon feed. In this design, paint is siphoned up from below into the airbrush. The main value of a siphon-fed airbrush is that the vessel allows you to use a larger quantity of paint, which makes it great to paint a large amount of models or something very big. The downside of the siphon feed is that it's harder to change the paint out. I often find that while airbrushing, I'm mixing paint in the pot or changing colors and not painting a huge quantity of models too often, so I tend to stick to gravity-fed airbrushes. Generally speaking, a siphon-fed airbrush requires more air pressure to operate because you need air pressure to siphon paint out of the reservoir and also air pressure to propel that paint onto whatever it is you're painting. With a gravity-fed airbrush, gravity is helping you so you can use lower pressure, which means you have more control. You'll see why later having lower pressure allows for more control. As an alternative to both of these designs, you have side feed airbrushes, which have the value of also not blocking the view and operating like a gravity fed airbrush. For beginners, however, side feed airbrushes tend to have a lot of attachments and add-ons and things to buy. So for a beginner, it makes sense to use the more simple gravity fed airbrush. After the cup, the other component of the airbrush that gets the most recognition is the trigger, which has various functions depending on what type of airbrush you get. At the basic level, you have a single action airbrush. This trigger functions like a light switch. When you push it down, it's either blowing paint or it isn't. The more you push the trigger down, the more airflow you get, but I find that most airbrushes, not all, have such short travel that it's very difficult to get that degree of control. After single action airbrushes, we have dual action airbrushes. It's the same idea with pushing the trigger down, but as you pull the trigger back, you get more and more paint. Lastly, there is such a thing as a pistol trigger airbrush. Instead of having the trigger on top of the body, this sits below. For some people, this is more comfortable of an experience. The cool part of a pistol grip airbrush is that it manages to still have the dual action functionality while only having one actionable button to interface with the airbrush. When you first pull back on the trigger, you only get air, but if you keep pulling, you'll start to get paint. Only some at first, but more, the more you start to pull. And then when you let go, the paint stops and then the air stops. This means that you can't modulate the amount of air pressure and paint independently, but it does teach you good airbrushing practices, which we'll get into later. Now that we've described some of the most recognizable components of an airbrush, let's go over how an airbrush actually functions and talk about some of the less notable components of the internals of an airbrush. For the rest of the video, we'll be talking about a dual action gravity fed airbrush because that's the most ubiquitous design that you see in the miniature painting hobby. So what actually happens when you push down on the airbrush trigger and you hear that hissing sound? 
Well, pressurized air travels up from where the hose is to the front of the airbrush. And because it's traveling in a corridor that's getting more and more narrow, it causes a localized low air pressure in this portion. Now at this point, the needle is resting perfectly inside of the needle nozzle, not letting any paint get out into this front element. But as you pull back on the trigger, you pull this tapered needle back into the airbrush, causing a little gap here. Now all of a sudden, paint can get into this front area. But why would it want to? Well, it does it via a thing called the Venturi effect. The air here is at a low air pressure, and the air here is at a normal air pressure. And because of that, a vacuum occurs, sucking paint out of the airbrush and out of the front in a fine spray mist. Now, not all airbrushes mix paint internally, like the ones that we use for the hobby do, the HPCS, the SOTAR 2020. Some mix paint and air externally, but this often results in a wider and coarser spray pattern. So for painting miniatures, it isn't the most useful, unless you're like base coating or priming terrain or a large volume of minis. But what about all those extra tools you need to start airbrushing? Well, that's a good question. Let's talk about some of the most helpful accessories that you can have while airbrushing. Probably the most obvious of them all is a compressor. Some people have really strong opinions about compressors. I am not one of them. Just get one with a tank, a moisture trap, and a way to regulate the pressure and you're done. Another pretty obvious accessory that I recommend using is a prefabricated thinner of some kind. You can make your own, but you can also go with the no fuss solution of just having one that's already done. And I'm a fan of Vallejo's airbrush thinner. You'll need Teflon tape or pipe dope or beeswax or some way to seal up the connections to limit air leakage. Oftentimes a roll of tape comes with your compressor a spray bottle, a cleaner of some kind, a wrench or vice grips to unstick pesky airbrush parts, some oil to grease the threads of your components and your needle, gloves if you don't wanna get any paint on your hands, and a respirator. Even though most of the paints that we use are non-toxic, it's probably not a bad idea to avoid getting any kind of paint particles in your lungs. And it's also a good practice to develop when you actually do start using things more toxic like enamels, etc. You can find all these parts linked in the description below. So now you know all the fancy words and all the fancy tools. As miniature painting airbrushers, we use an internally mixed, dual action, gravity fed airbrush. Now with that out of the way, let's get on to some real practical advice. In order to unlock the full potential of an airbrush, the most important concept for you to understand is the relationship between the viscosity of the paint inside the airbrush and also the air pressure of your compressor. So let's start there. Some of the first questions people ask when they start airbrushing is what PSI should I use or how much should I thin my paint for the airbrush? Just like with paint brushes, there is no one answer for either of these questions. Let me help you figure out how to answer this question for yourself depending on what you're doing. So let's start with the most basic usage of the airbrush, base coating and priming. For these applications where you want coverage quickly, you're going to use a thicker paint because the more you thin your paint, the more translucent it becomes. Because your paint is thicker, you need to use a higher PSI, something like 25 to even upwards of 30. So now we understand the first part of the relationship. If I wanna use thicker paint, I need to use a higher PSI. This makes sense because thicker paint is harder to propel. Because it's harder, we need a stronger vacuum. Because we need a stronger vacuum, we need more air pressure. Now there's a problem with high pressure and that's when we wanna get close and detailed with our airbrush. If you're base coating, this isn't really a problem. The further you are from your miniature, the wider your spray pattern, the bigger your coverage. This is actually desirable when you're base coating. What if you want to be more accurate with your airbrush? Well, if you get in close with your airbrush on high pressure, bad things happen. The pressure from the brush makes the paint spread, which is not at all what you want. Okay, so the pressure is too high and we need to lower it. So let's do that. If we lower the pressure and start spraying, what you'll notice is that now we're getting more of a speckled application. This happens when your paint is too thick or your air pressure is too low. So that means if we want a low pressure so we can be closer with our airbrush, we need to thin our paint more. Now we can be close, get nice tight lines with minimal speckling. 
So through this little demonstration, we've explored the entire equation. You want to base coat stuff really fast, use thick paint and high pressure and back away from the miniature to limit spider webbing. You want to be more controlled and have more accuracy and get in tighter areas, use thinner paint, lower pressure and get physically closer to the miniature. Obviously, there's a spectrum in between these two extremes. You can go with a medium opacity and a medium air pressure. It's all dependent on what you want to do. I've linked a little graph in the description that will help you troubleshoot your airbrush PSI and dilution problems until you fully grasp the relationship. Now, before we start applying paint with our airbrush, let's make sure that it actually is in a working state right now. Nothing sucks quite like getting a bunch of nicely mixed paint into your airbrush only to figure out that your trigger or your needle is stuck in some way. This is pretty simple. Just try to run some water through your airbrush to make sure everything is okay. If you've airbrushed in the past, what you may discover is that you didn't do the greatest job cleaning and something is gunked up. It's a good idea to take care of these problems now before proceeding. Now let's mix up some paint and actually do some airbrushing. From my personal experience, I've never found a paint range to not work at all for the airbrush, but certain ranges work better than others. Most notably, ranges that have a very matte finish aren't the easiest to airbrush, stuff like scale 75. Regardless of what paint range you use, however, the process looks mostly the same. Before putting any paint in your airbrush's cup, it's generally considered a best practice to mix and thin your paints outside of your paint cup. This allows you to ensure that the paint is fully mixed as well as easily remove any dried bits of paint or unmixed chunks that would likely cause clogs. Once you got the consistency of paint where you want it based on what you're trying to do, it's time to start actually airbrushing. Oftentimes I will test the paint in my airbrush on something other than my model before applying it to see if the airbrush is behaving in the way that I expect it to, like on a gloved hand or some piece of plastic laying around. You pour the paint into the cup and begin to gently pulse the paint. Consider a rhythm like this. Air pressure fully coming out. Gently start to apply the paint. Gently stop applying the paint. Stop the air pressure. All of your paint application should be buffered by just straight air coming out of your airbrush. You do this for a few reasons. Generally, you want to dry the paint you are applying as soon as it comes out. This reduces the odds of spider webbing. Apply a little bit, dry it with the air of the airbrush, rinse and repeat. Another reason you apply paint in this rhythm is if you cut the air and the paint at the exact same time, you sometimes get a little dribble on the end of your needle. This little droplet is your worst enemy. And when you go back to start painting again and apply air pressure, that little droplet is shot off the end of your airbrush into whatever you're painting, likely ruining it. It sucks. YouTube, what are you doing in my refrigerator, you sneaky little Chad? Well, while I have your attention, let me tease a little release that's coming out on Black Friday that's a little bit vampiric. you have to wait until Black Friday to figure out what it's going to be, but it's something I am super excited about. All right, back to the video. All right, you understand what I consider to be the fundamentals of using an airbrush at a beginner level, but I think there's some value in talking through typical airbrush applications. Base coating and priming is easy enough to understand, but what if I want to get a blend from one part to the next on a miniature? Let's talk through that. All right, in today's live demonstration, we're going to be painting a Space Marine because you all know how much I love my Space Marines. We're going to paint a Ultramarine shoulder pad, and we're starting with Regal Blue, which is an old Citadel color from Games Workshop. Again, using that range because Citadel's more satin than the other guys. We're doing a base coat here, so I'm going to make this dilution a little bit thicker than I normally would. And this particular segment is playing back in real time. So you can kind of see how slowly and gradually I build up the layers. Now, as a reminder, I am doing mostly air and less paint than you probably think. I'm trying to dry each layer of paint before I apply the next one by pulsing air in between my applications of paint.
and another layer because I want to get brighter of a blue color. All right, now we're gonna mix in some Hawk Turquoise, which is a turquoise as its name suggests, into the Regal Blue to get a little bit of a brighter color. And because we mixed in thicker paint, we need to mix in more of the Vallejo Airbrush Thinner to dilute it a little bit. Doing some back blow mixing to mix it up. And we're gonna test it on the little holder there. Make sure all the Regal Blue is out of the front of the airbrush. And now we'll start to slowly apply a highlight. I want you to really notice how little my finger is pulling the trigger back, really just doing little bursts of paints and trying to dry it with air in between. One thing I wanna address is that I am mixing paint in the cup and I do fully admit that is not a good practice and I just do it because I'm lazy. I don't have anything around me to mix paint in. So if you wanna be lazy like me, you can do that. Or if you wanna do a best practice, mix it in a little cup or a little dish or something and then pour it into your airbrush's cup. All right, now we're gonna mix in some FW white acrylic ink to develop a highlight. I use acrylic ink to make my highlights because it's higher flow. If you wanna find out more information about that, you can watch the video linked to the top right hand corner of the screen. Same process. Thinning it a little bit, testing on the handle, and then slowly pulsing it toward the top of the shoulder pad, making sure not to get too much down in the mid-tone and the shadow area. Going really slowly, move my finger a tiny amount, making sure to dry each layer before applying more to avoid spider webbing. A little bit more, a little bit more thinner as well to get even brighter of a highlight, and even some more and some more thinner apparently, jeez. Some back blow mixing. And targeting a very small area, super close to the miniature. At this point, I did turn down my PSI to like 15, so I can get closer without risking too much spider webbing. Now the problem with highlighting with an airbrush is that you often go a little bit too crazy with your highlight, so we're gonna bring back the shadows a little bit with some thin down chaos black or Abaddon black as it's now called. So I'll take some black paint, thin it down quite a bit with Vallejo airbrush thinner, and then apply it toward the bottoms of the shoulder pads to kind of bring back some of that darkness. I tend to do my highlights first and then my shadows second whenever doing the airbrush. Now I'm targeting the bottom corners of the airbrush here to bring some more contrast. You could have stopped at the first highlight we did, but I like to do a little bit of extra credit here to really kind of stretch the airbrush's legs. Now the problem with this step is that I kind of have the two areas subdivided a little bit. I have a lot of highlight and a lot of dark shadow. And so to bring back some of that mid-tone, I'm gonna take Gulliman Blue, which is a glaze, to bring back some rich mid-tone. Now, if you were a better airbrusher than me, you could probably skip this step because you wouldn't have gone so ham with your highlight and your shadow, but I'm bad. So I'm bringing back some of that rich mid-tone with a little bit of Gulliman Glaze. You could replace this with ink or just a normal paint too, but I like to demonstrate all the different products that you can use through an airbrush, and there are even more than this. Once this is done, that's the last step and you can see the blend from bright to dark. It's not flawless by any means. You can see some speckles, but it's pretty dang good. This has been Live Painting, brought to you by Miniac, the Miniature Maniac, signing out. <laughs> All right, we've done a lot of airbrushing today, but before we fully quit, it's time to clean our airbrush nice and thoroughly. I often start by taking a spray bottle and removing the excess paint from the pot into a cup. Another option would be to spray it all out. But my thoughts here with the spray bottle, that the less paint that comes out through the front of my airbrush, the less paint that can get dried and stick in little areas internally. Once that's suitably clean, I then start to rinse the airbrush with a 50-50 mixture of ammonia-free glass cleaner and water spraying through the front until it's clean. Ammonia-free glass cleaner allows me to clean the internals of my airbrush without running the risk of harming some of the rubber or Teflon gaskets like isopropyl and ammonia are capable of doing. I also mix in some back flowing by covering the front element with a finger and a sponge and blowing cleaner back in where the needle seal is and agitating it a little bit. 
The needle seal is what blocks all of the liquid from entering into the back portion of your airbrush where your trigger is. Some folks may say that this is dangerous, and it may be, but if you're careful, you won't damage the tip of your needle. On my particular airbrush, the Iwata HPCS, I don't even come into contact with the tip of the needle. All I do is put my finger around the ring of the crown and it works great. Specific cleaning steps vary from airbrush to airbrush. For instance, on my HPCS, paint gets stuck in between the needle seal and the cup and it's hard to get out. Because of this, part of my cleaning process is to have cleaner in the cup and then very slightly push the needle in and out to tease that paint out of that area. Note that I'm not pulling the needle out so far that it starts to taper. If I did that, I'd be getting paint in my trigger area, which is something you definitely want to avoid. Once you're all clean and rinsed, it's always a good idea to take the needle fully out and give it a very thin film of oil for next time. I use Badger's Needle Juice. There is a lot to talk about when it comes to airbrushing, and I undoubtedly did not answer all of your beginner questions, so I asked some of my patrons for some common beginner questions that I'll answer right here, right now. Do you still need a thin paints designed for airbrushing? Certain brands like Vallejo and Citadel have paints that are pre-thinned for airbrushing usage, but it really depends on what you want to do as to whether or not you should thin them or not. These are likely ready to go for applying base coats and things similar to that. But if you want to do more subtle work like layering or a blending or a combination of those, you will likely need to thin them a little bit more. How much should I clean in between colors? It really depends on what colors you're swapping in between. If I'm going from a light brown to a lighter brown, I'm not too concerned with how much I clean in between those two tones. But if I'm going from something like black to white, then I'll do a much more thorough clean job like previously described. Can you thin paint with water? You definitely can in a pinch, but what you'll discover over time is that a thinner does a better job of preventing clogs from happening and also applying paint more smoothly. These are all questions from my patrons as previously discussed because this is a new video series that I'm doing for Patreon. I have a new reward for my Acolyte tier which says that you have the ability to supply suggestions for video topics and also vote on your favorite ones. And this is the first one I'm doing, a beginner airbrushing one. These videos will always be sponsor free which allows me to shout out some of my new patrons. So in this video we're shouting out Overdrive Active, Austin B, Iron Giant, Ryan T. Junior, Manuel Munoz, Dylan Bain, Hunter, Autumn Elliott, Adam Topless, Corey Smith, Philip Eckert, Honeycomb, Dreadnaughty, Jonathan Cool, AJ Ello, John, Justin, Stephen Moser, Kit Hayden, Minis by Applesauce, Taylor Robinalt, Ian Boyt, The Dungeon Master, Josh Sharp, Killer Lurch, Kevin Wack, Kelsey Graham, Mark Asuncion, Michael A. Drury, Matt Federchak, and Chenster. Thank you guys for being my patrons for this month, and also thanks to all of my current and past patrons for supporting this absolutely ridiculous job that I have making videos about painting tiny plastic toy soldiers. If you are interested in supporting the channel and supporting these super geeky videos, you can find out more about what I offer on my Patreon, linked in the description below. While this video may be incomplete, I hope it addressed a lot of knowledge that you'll need when airbrushing for the first time. Maybe in the future, we can go over more advanced information. Do you guys think I missed any essential beginner knowledge? Let me know in the comment section below. If you're looking for an airbrush to buy for the first time, check out my airbrush comparison video I did. If you guys like videos about airbrushes, I have a few more that you can find that I'll link at the end of the video. If you guys like the channel and you want to support it, there are a number of ways that you can do that, namely buying merch like this t-shirt, becoming a patron, or using my Amazon affiliate link while shopping on Amazon. All things linked in the description below. Subscribe or die! And most importantly, don't forget to paint! More minutes!